OpenRPG Creative License. ORC, which is cute, because that's an orc. I'm Ronald, Rules Lawyer, and there is big news in the tabletop role-playing space with Paizo, the number two in the industry, uh, second to Wizards of the Coast, and maker of Pathfinder RPG and Starfinder, has announced that it is funding a legal effort to create a system-agnostic open game license that is not owned by any publisher making money from RPGs. This is fresh news. I'm recording this 28 minutes after this got leaked on Twitter. I got this tweet from Rob Pontius, who was able to catch some screenshots of Paizo.com's blog making this announcement. And apparently that website has crashed um, as a result of these this news. And I can confirm, yeah, the, it's crashed. Those not in the know, Wizards of the Coast, which owns the IP for Dungeons and & Dragons and promulgates the open game license under which the vast majority of publishers for tabletop role-playing games publish their products is uh, intending to revoke that license, pulling the rug out under from many creators, large and small, who have relied for over 20 years on the promise and the intentions of Wizards of the Coast at the time it was originally released that it would never be revoked and that people uh, have the security of of knowing that they can publish under it without having to pay royalties and that they will uh, be able to do so uh, without it being re revoked. And I recommend for uh, insights into that, the interview by Roll for Combat with Ryan Dancy, who was an executive of Wizards of the Coast, who was one of the two key people who, from the design side, worked with Brian Lewis of a law firm to create the OGL for the purpose of making it a open gaming license that could not be revoked. And there's now a burgeoning movement of people canceling and deleting their D&D Beyond accounts to send a message that they are breaking with Wizards of the Coast no matter what they do at this point. An effort which I heartily endorse to send a message to this corporation that it cannot betray people like this and no other corporation should feel like they can get away with it either. It was widely believed that four hours ago, Wizards of the Coast would publish a video announcing their new quote-unquote OGL, and it was not put up. Uh, and there's been this movement, as I said, of canceling D&D Beyond accounts. So they are either wavering on what they want to do exactly, or are trying to retailer their message in some fashion. The fact that people have only been mobilizing more against this terrible, threatened new OGL probably means that their planned video drop was essentially going to do in the main what has been leaked. That's all it can be. It's not like they were thinking their video was going to describe new terms that were too generous and that the momentum was convincing them that they could get away with more than what they thought. There have been rumblings since this post on Discord, which I was surprised to see was dated yesterday. A lot has happened and has been happening very quickly, in which on the Defend the OGL Discord server, which I will include a link to in the video description, uh, Brian Lewis, who crafted was the attorney crafting the original OGL, uh, was quoted reaching out to publishers who want to collaborate on making a truly independent OGL that is owned by no one and that cannot be revoked. And I showed that on the screen for anyone who wants to read it. But I will read in full Paizo's announcement, which is today's news. After I read it out, I'll give my analysis and comments on it. So here's the news. Paizo announces system-neutral open RPG license. For the last several weeks, as rumors of Wizards of the Coast's new version of the open game license began circulating among publishers and on social media, Gamers across the world have been asking what Paizo plans to do in light of concerns regarding Wizards of the Coast's rumored plan to deauthorize the existing OGL 1.0a. We have been awaiting further information, hoping that Wizards would realize that, for more than 20 years, the OGL has been a mutually beneficial license which should not and cannot be revoked. 
while we continue to await an answer from wizards, we strongly feel that Paizo can no longer delay making our own feelings about the importance of open gaming a part of the public discussion. We believe that any interpretation that the OGL 1.0 or 1.0a were intended to be re revocable or able to be deauthorized is incorrect, and with good reason. We were there. Paizo owner Lisa Stevens and Paizo president Jim Butler were leaders on the Dungeons & Dragons team at Wizards at the time. Brian Lewis, co-founder of Azora Law, the intellectual property law firm that Paizo uses, was the attorney at Wizards who came up with the legal framework for the OGL itself. Paizo has also worked very closely on OGL-related issues with Ryan Dancy, the visionary who conceived the OGL in the first place. Paizo does not believe that the OGL 1.0a can be, quote, deauthorized, unquote, ever. While we are prepared to argue that point in a court of law if need be, we don't want to have to do that, and we know that many of our fellow publishers are not in a position to do so. We have no interest whatsoever in Wizards' new OGL. Instead, we have a plan that we believe will irrevocably and unquestionably keep alive the spirit of the open game license. As Paizo has evolved, the parts of the OGL that we ourselves value have changed. When we needed to quickly bring out Pathfinder First Edition to continue publishing our popular monthly adventures back in 2008, using Wizards language was important and expeditious. But in our non-RPG products, including our Pathfinder Tales novels, the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game, and others, we shifted our focus away from D&D tropes to lean harder into ideas from our own writers. By the time we went to work on Pathfinder 2nd Edition, Wizards of the Coast's open game content was significantly less important to us, and so our designers and developers wrote the new edition without using Wizards' copyrighted expressions of any game mechanics. While we still published it under the OGL, the reason was no longer to allow Paizo to use Wizards expressions, but to allow other companies to use our expressions. We believe, as we always have, that open gaming makes games better, improves profitability for all involved, and enriches the community of gamers who participate in this amazing hobby. And so we invite gamers from around the world to join us as we begin the next great chapter of open gaming with the release of a new open, perpetual, and irrevocable Open RPG Creative License, ORC, which is cute because that's an orc. The new Open RPG Creative License will be built system agnostic for independent game publishers under the legal guidance of Azora Law, an intellectual property law firm that represents Paizo and several other game publishers. Paizo will pay for this legal work. We invite game publishers worldwide to join us in support of this system agnostic license that allows all games to provide their own unique open rules reference documents that open up their individual game systems to the world. To join the effort and provide feedback on the drafts of this license, please sign up by using this form. In addition to Paizo, Cobalt Press, Chaosium, Green Ronin, Legendary Games, Rogue Genius Games, and a growing list of publishers have already agreed to participate in the Open RPG Creative License, and in the coming days we hope and expect to add substantially to this group. The ORC will not be owned by Paizo, nor will it be owned by any company who makes money publishing RPGs. Azora Law's ownership of the process and stewardship should provide a safe harbor against any company being bought, sold, or changing management in the future and attempting to rescind rights or nullify such sections or nullify sections of the license. Ultimately, we plan to find a nonprofit with a history of open source values to own this license, such as the Linux Foundation. Of course, Paizo plans to continue publishing Pathfinder and Starfinder even as we move away from the open gaming license. Since months worth of products are still at the printer, You'll see the familiar OGL 1.0a in the back of our products for a while yet. While the Open RPG Creative License is being finalized, we'll be printing Pathfinder and Starfinder products without any license, and we'll add the finished license to those products when the new license is complete. We hope that you will continue to support Paizo and other game publishers in this difficult time for the entire hobby. You can do your part by supporting the many companies that have provided content under the OGL. Support Pathfinder and Starfinder by visiting your local game store, subscribing to Pathfinder and Starfinder, 
or taking advantage of discount code OPENGAMING during checkout for 25% off your purchase of the Core Rulebook, Core Rulebook Pocket Edition, or Pathfinder Beginner Box. Support Cobalt Press, Green Ronin, Legendary Games, Roll for Combat, Rogue Genius Games, and other publishers working to preserve a prosperous future for open gaming that is both perpetual and irrevocable. We'll be there at your side. You can count on us not to go back on our word forever. So now to summarize and analyze what's going on here, I think it's awesome that Paizo says that they will pay for this legal work and that the product will not be owned by Paizo or any company, as they say, that would make profit from selling RPG products, that it can truly be safe. I think it's great too that they give links to other third-party companies, which has been their historical practice to support third parties uh, who are publishing, well, for Pathfinder first edition at that time, uh, but now those who are rallying around the ORC. First, to clarify what this ORC is and what open source is, OGL purported to be that. It said not only could you use rules and mechanics promulgated by Wizards of the Coast under the third edition and later fifth edition SRDs, but that if you were to do so, uh, everything you publish under that license can then be copied and borrowed by publishers in the future, except for the things that you copyright and assert uh, in that small print language at the back of your book. So what it does is it fosters a collaborative uh, culture of innovation where people can borrow and build upon other people's ideas. From this blog post, that appears to be the intention of what this ORC would be. Of course, we need to see the actual text, the actual fine print before we can say that for sure. And they likely and are correctly waiting until the actual new language is released by Wizards of the Coast before finalizing their own language as an answer to what Wizards of the Coast puts out. However, this blog post sets forth a set of principles that I think the community should rally around for some reason that I don't understand. Uh, this was not done in 2000, and perhaps the thinking was that Wizards of the Coast with uh, the D&D brand uh, needed to do it, uh, publish it on its own under its name, and own the license in putting it out. I don't know, and I don't know whether that was true. But what, whatever it was, the reality was that whatever the language said, it was something that Wizards of the Coast reserved the right to update and revise. Also, it did not have the word irrevocable in it, even though to a layperson saying that the license was perpetual obviously means that it was intended to not be revoked. And Ryan Dancy, in the interview with Roll for Combat, makes clear that there were companies suspicious of Wizards of the Coast leading up to the official release of the OGL and that lawyers were going around to them and people representing Wizards of the Coast intentions uh, were going to them uh, saying that you can trust this license, that it will not be revoked in the future. Paizo is making clear in this post that they will defend the original intention of OGL 1.0a in court but at the same time, we'll be funding the creation of this ORC. Now, one might be concerned that signing on to this or supporting this ORC concedes that the OGL is not irrevocable. However, my personal take, again, my not specialty is not IP law and contract law, which is what this is about, is that the weight of the evidence, the language in the OGL, what it said to, in FAQs and in a number of conversations with third-party publishers, that that should win the day. As Ryan Dancy said in the interview, the very fact that it's irrevocable is precisely what made the license attractive in the first place, got a whole sea of third-party companies publishing under it, and all of that benefited Wizards of the Coast, and it fostered D&D &D becoming the default tabletop role-playing game, the participation of this community under the, in the OGL. 
another argument that this ORC does not concede that the OGL is irrevocable is the fact is the timing of this announcement because this effort began in response to credible leaks of what Wizards of the Coast's intention is in revoking the OGL. It is a fallback. It is possible to defend your rights in one respect while asserting your rights in another respect in a court. I don't know what the time frame is uh, when we will see the language of the ORC, but I'd be very curious to see that. Uh, first, of course, uh, Wizards needs to release its OGL, and they also want to draw the participation of more companies, clearly. We don't see uh, where MCDM, Matt Colville's company, and Critical Role fall, for instance. But I do think that all companies should support these principles that are being put out and participate in it. And uh, if they have any suspicion about Paizo's intentions, um, to be part of it so that they can press for it to be truly company agnostic and system agnostic and make it a truly universal everybody against WOTC collaborative effort that it should be. Uh, participating in the drafting and conversations around it does not bind you to release anything under it. After WOTC releases its new OGL and this ORC comes out, this ORC is going to be the opposite pole, the alternative for the entire third party community uh, to possibly publish under. It likely will not have any aggressive terms claiming that it can be terminated within 30 days uh, unilaterally by the licensor and not have any claim to own your content after you publish under it, which is what the leaked language uh, for Wizards says. So this announcement itself is going to put further pressure on Wizards of the Coast to not have uh, such an aggressive, rapacious version of the OGL that they put out. Now, how different from D&D does an RPG system need to be in order to be safe from Wizards? And on that, Pathfinder 2nd Edition is an important test case, or will be one. If Wizards does not go after Pathfinder 2, then any system that departs from D&D &D, at least as much as Pathfinder 2 departs from 3rd edition D&D &D, should be safe. Pathfinder 2nd edition itself did not need to publish under the OGL, as this post from Michael Sayer of Paizo from, granted, nearly a year ago seems to make clear. It says, every word of Pathfinder 2 was written from scratch. Many of the concepts, fighter, wizard, cleric, spell levels, feats, chromatic dragons, etc., are not legally distinct or defensible except under very specific trade dress protections that Paizo's work is all or mostly distinct from anyways. And game mechanics are not generally copyrightable, even if Pathfinder 2's were not all written from the ground up. Most of the monsters that touch Watsi's trade dress protections for example, real-world monsters modified heavily enough to have a distinct Watsi version that's legally protectable, have already been reworked or were just always presented as legally distinct versions that don't require the OGL, and things like Paizo's goblins have always been legally distinct for trade dress law and protected for many years despite being released as part of a system using the OGL. Considerations like keeping the game approachable for third-party publishers, the legal costs of establishing a separate Paizo-specific license, concerns about freelancers not paying attention to key differences between Paizo and Watsi IP, etc., all played a bigger role in Pathfinder's continued use of the OGL than any need to keep the system under it. Not using the OGL was a serious consideration for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but it would have significantly increased the costs related to releasing the new edition and meant that freelancer turnovers would have required an extra layer of scrutiny to make sure people were not, unintentionally or otherwise, slipping their favorite D&Disms into Pathfinder products. It would have also meant all the third-party publishers needed to relearn a new license and produce their content under different licenses depending on the edition they were producing for, a level of complication deemed prohibitive to the health of the game. And of course, at the time, everybody was thinking that Wizards of the Coast was not going to try to revoke it. Now, that is ORC. That is for people who, like 
Paizo with Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Cobalt Press, which has announced that it's going to create its own RPG system, they could publish under that and be safe from Wizards of the Coast. However, things would still remain uncertain for publishers who would still want to publish content compatible with 5th Edition D&D. 3rd edition D&D and Pathfinder 1st edition, which are essentially the same, and the OSR, older editions of D&D. There will be a battle of some kind, uh, regardless of what happens with the ORC and uh, the success of people who are publishing content that are breaking with D&D. Our first line of defense is going to be the legal battle that the OGL 1.0a is irrevocable. If that were lost, then there would need to be if this ORC is what this blog post promises it to be, a movement among third parties to make systems that continue the spirit of those editions. And in the case of 5e, as I make clear in my Lawyer's Critique series on the 1D&D playtest, uh, long overdue improvements to 5th edition that would make the game better for its audience. This is an exciting time for the hobby. Wizards of the Coast let the cat out of the bag, and a lot of people have lost all trust in the company and are not going back, even if Wizards of the Coast does a complete about face. And it has sparked this effort, which, if it is what it promises to be, will allow a truly open license and a industry and many third-party publishers producing content that is not subject to Wizards of the Coast's dictates that is collaborative, innovative, and not stale. Even if Wizards of the Coast backtracks, it is pretty clear that some third-party publishers will publish systems divorced from D&D that there can be a thriving third-party ecosystem under, under the ORC. Virtual tabletops and digital tools and online references of rule sets would still, could still live under the systems that publish under an ORC. And in the meantime, uh, make sure to make clear to Wizards of the Coast that you disagree with their plan to revoke the OGL. Cancel your subscription to D&D Beyond. I might comment on this in a future video, but my take is that they are prepared to burn bridges with the community because they are looking forward to an exponential growth in people playing the game as a result of the D&D movie their four-pillar strategy, basically, the Baldur's Gate 3 video game coming out this year, and that there will be a huge influx that outnumbers the current audience that has no uh, expectation of open gaming and being able to play games in a relatively inexpensive, collaborative, mutually supportive environment. And so I joined the call on people to cancel their subscriptions, and if you've decided never to go back to Wizards, to delete your account and make clear that when this sexy new VTT comes out and the current outrage wanes, which is what they're counting on, that you are not coming back. Absolutely no way that's going to happen. I also call on third-party companies to say they will collaborate with this effort, and if not, to explain why. I think also, if the text is truly in the spirit of this blog post, that the community should unite behind it for the principle of open gaming. Because it fosters innovation, a sharing of ideas, prevents a walled garden, having a D&D be successful and lifting all boats within the hobby generally is true, but it's also true that a monopoly by any company is not good for the hobby. And I will end with a final thought, which is that Wizards done fucked up. And Joe DeFrogman is someone on my server who I will quote, uh, who essentially said that they are thinking that they are preventing the creation of another Paizo, another successful uh, competitor. And they say as much in the leaked OGL that they're subsidizing large competitors. Wizards of the Coast is thinking that the open gaming license created its biggest competitor in Paizo. However, that is not what happened. It was them moving away from the OGL with 4th edition under publishing that under the GSL that allowed their competitor to 
become as successful as it has. And they are absolutely mistaken. So if they decide to go ahead with this boneheaded mistake of making a GSL 2.0, they're going to create their own major competitor, except it's likely going to be more than one this time around. And I welcome that development. So that's it. I have been Ronald, the rules lawyer. Like and subscribe. I'm going to do a live stream of the final language that Wizards of the Coast puts out and also of the ORC once that goes out and provide my analysis and ring the bell for that too so that you get notified of live streams. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.